I want to now focus on the reproduction of reef building corals and explore some of the ramifications of their reproductive biology in terms of population structure and connectivity. Reef building corals show a broad range of reproductive strategies including asexual reproduction through the division of polyps as well as sexual reproduction involving gonochorism in some species and hermaphrodism in others. In fact, most corals are hermaphrodites as opposed to having separate sexes. Among the hermaphroditic species, there are many that are simultaneous hermaphrodites as well as those that show protandry or protogyny. In terms of reproductive strategies, there are broadcast spawners as well as brooders. Most, if not all, larvae are non-feeding or lectotrophic. Let's now consider a typical coral life cycle. In this case, the coral is from the genus Acropora, which tend to be simultaneous hermaphrodites, which broadcast spawn. Corals from the genus Acropora are ubiquitous within the world's tropical coastal environments. Over 149 species have been reported, and they are a major contributor to the three-dimensional habitats that are so important within carbonate coral reef ecosystems. They are also prominent participants in mass spawning in areas such as the Great Barrier Reef, usually spawning four to six days after the full moon. As you can see in this diagram, acropid corals release eggs and sperms in bundles. The buoyant eggs dragging the bundles to the surface where they break open and fertilization occurs. Now importantly, because of the problem of self-fertilization, there are many mechanisms in place to prevent the fertilization of one individual's eggs by its own sperm. Now, after fertilization has occurred between two distinct individuals, the planular larvae, usually around 36 hours, develops. Now the planular larva is like a little cigar. It's a typical uh, cnidarian larval form. Sometime later, the larvae may flatten out into a prawn chip shape, and after four to five days, they begin to head away from the surface down to the bottom in search of suitable habitat. On finding that habitat, the larvae develops into uh, the primary polyp, which then undergoes asexual reproduction, dividing or cloning into a number of other polyps within the coral colony. And years later, as the colony grows and becomes mature, the cycle is repeated and egg and sperm bundles are released back into the water column during mass spawning. Let's now have a look at the various parts of the life cycle of reef building corals. In this movie, an acropora coral colony is releasing sperm and egg bundles as part of the mass coral spawning event, which occurs on the Great Barrier Reef at the end of spring. This photograph shows the typical slick that often occurs uh, in large parts of the intertidal region after a mass spawning event. What you're looking at here is literally millions and millions of sperm egg bundles that were released the night before. Often this material can then rot, causing very low oxygen levels, and in some cases, uh, mortality events among corals, as was seen in Western Australia some years ago. Now, this is a close-up of the sperm egg bundles. Right in the center there, you can see a large pinky mass, that's the eggs. And already leaking out of the sperm egg bundle, you can see uh, the, the whitish sperm. This figure is from a paper by Professor Pete Edmonds of Cal State Northridge, which shows typical planular larvae. In this case, they're from a number of non acroporid corals. What's interesting about this photograph is you can see the presence of zooxanthellae, the single-celled brown dinoflagellate symbionts that live inside corals. And these are photosynthetically active in the larvae, helping feed the larvae, which potentially is able to disperse further. In some species of coral, planulae may transform into larval forms that are affectionately known as prawn chip larvae. And soon after this, larvae will begin to head away from the surface 
towards the bottom and potentially respond to chemical cues and settle on the bottom of the sea. This photo shows a newly settled coral polyp which is already developing feeding tentacles and a population of zooxanthellae. Now, these newly settled polyps will grow into small colonies of polyps through asexual reproduction. I want to now turn to a discussion of how reproduction and recruitment link to dispersal and ultimately to the interconnectivity and structure of marine populations. These final issues link to other parts of the course where we are discussing how they influence decision making among marine spatial planners. In this case, connectivity between subpopulations is close to zero, especially in the case where there is a lot of self-recruitment back to their or original populations. Alternatively, increased larval life means greater distances dispersed and greater connectivity between populations. Going back to our schematic diagram, the length of larval life can increase to a point where there is active exchange of individuals and genetic material between subpopulations. In terms of the structure of the overall population, made up here by eight subpopulations, having a high degree of self-recruitment, perhaps, as a, as a, perhaps as a result of short distance dispersal, will increase the degree to which those populations become distinct over time. The more different the subpopulations become, the greater genetic distance between them. If dispersal distances are larger, then there's a greater exchange of individuals and genetic material between subpopulations, leading to a reduction in the genetic differences or structure between the eight subpopulations. Genetic differences can be measured by a number of techniques and essentially yield the length of the prongs in this diagram as a measure of the degree of difference between different subpopulations. And you can see in the case where you have a lot of dispersal between subpopulations, the amount of genetic distance is a lot less. The issue of population structure is important within the context of effective conservation planning and has been taken into account in recent attempts to try and apply a system which recognises the fact that some subpopulations as well as some reefs are in greater or less communication with each other via dispersal. Well, let's summarise. As we've seen, reproduction in the ocean is unique and is an enormous subject which we have only really scratched the surface of here in this introductory lecture. Up front, tropical coastal ecosystems reproduce in a fairly constant environment in which water is abundant. Because of the diversity of habitats and challenges, marine organisms have evolved a range of different modes of reproduction. Many marine organisms reproduce asexually in addition to undergoing sexual reproduction. And in this regard, there are advantages and disadvantages to both depending on the degree of environmental variability. Life cycles often involve broadcast spawning, where gametes and larvae may travel hundreds of kilometres before they settle. In other life cycles, dispersal differences can be quite short, especially when it comes to organisms which brood or release well-developed larvae. One of the most remarkable phenomena associated with tropical coastal ecosystems is the mass spawning which occurs on a few nights of the year in many parts of the world. Again, there are advantages and disadvantages to mass spawning, much of which you will explore as part of your knowledge acquisition moment within this lecture. In our final discussions, we explored the linkage between reproduction, recruitment and dispersal, and explored the ramifications of having greater or lesser genetic connectivity between subpopulations of an overall population. As we discussed, these issues will be picked up when we begin to discuss effective marine spatial planning. I was recently fortunate to catch up with coral biologists Dr. Eugenia Sampaio and Dr. Nella Rosick. These two young scientists are exploring different parts of the biology of corals, 
focusing in on the opportunities that they have during mass coral spawning on Heron Island on the southern Great Barrier Reef. Eugenia is studying how the biology of developing larvae is affected by environmental stress, particularly with a view to understand how corals may or may not survive future environmental changes. Nella, on the other hand, is working with a group of scientists trying to isolate DNA in preparation for sequencing the genome of a number of different corals. This project, which involves support from the Great Barrier Reef Foundation and the University of Queensland, among other partners, is essentially attempting to do what the Human Genome Project did for human biology.